Welcome back to the Security Unhappy Hour, where we bring together a group of security professionals and naturally cheery folks to discuss topics in the cybersecurity community, share knowledge, learn, teach, and exchange ideas. Now, before we get started, it's important to point out that the views and opinions expressed on the Security Unhappy Hour and related websites are those of the hosts, guests, and authors, and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any one company. Now, today, my co-hosts, Lisa Bradley, Katie Noble, Krobe, and I are going to talk about uh, talking with your executives in your company about PCERT. PCERT tends to have different stakeholders that are based on their business model and their portfolio, uh, even the complexity of their ecosystem. Um, for example, the stakeholders often include executives or seniors, senior business leaders, uh, internal development teams, uh, external component providers, uh, even an organization's customer base. And knowing your stakeholders and working with senior executives can make or break your vulnerability disclosure program. So one of the things, this is really a, a key topic for anybody that's starting up a PCERT. And I'm wondering from all of you, what are those critical things for somebody who is trying to get a PCERT off the ground or trying to, to explain to their executives of the, the reasons to invest in a P-cert, um, what are those critical items that you have? Um, I'll start. So my two major pinpoints that I usually talk about are um, customer risk and brand reputational damage. So I, I, you know, it's very easy nowadays to see all the media articles um, that are out there that focus on, you know, oh, this big, you know, vulnerability in the field and all these customer data is reached out and breached and blah, 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 blah. So, um, you know, I talk about, we don't want to be a headline. We don't want to ruin our brand that we have to have the right practices. And then, um, when I think about customer risk, it's always protecting the customers, but I always can show that it's a customer ask to, when we look at a lot of the contracts that we're having with our customers, where they're putting in clauses about, you know, that we deal with, you know, have SDL and we deal with vulnerabilities. So those are the two major things that I tend to focus on when I'm trying to importance of PCERT. Katie, what about you? I guess when I think about PCERT, I think about what happens if you don't. Um, so I guess there's a huge difference in, in how we used to think about product security, incident response, and then how we how we think about it these days. And how we used to think about it even, you know, five, 10 years ago, um, when a researcher, when somebody came to you with a vulnerability, it wasn't necessarily a widely accepted practice to be able to receive that vulnerability and, and mitigate it and push out patches the way that we do today. It's changed a lot. And so I think about like, what if you don't have a piece of program? Where does that go? And I always like, I always like to use this example of like a house. If you bought a house that was built in like 1850 and doesn't have indoor plumbing, you know, and the problem is that the county is telling you that you have to have indoor plumbing. And if you don't, like they're they're gonna turn on water to your house and they've been telling you for years, like we're gonna turn the water onto your house. Uh, we're we're pu putting the pipe in the road or we're about to turn it on. And then like, they just notify you like, okay, we've done it. And now we're going to turn on this water. And if you don't have that plumbing installed, the water is just going to go into your basement. And that's just going to cause you so much structural damage to your organization because you didn't have all of that plumbing in place to be able to handle that, the, those submissions and the, that information. So I was thinking about like, what happens if you don't have a piecer, then a researcher has two options. They can do nothing or they can publicly shame you uh, by putting it in a, a public place like a Twitter or a Pasteben. And so it's really up. Well, actually, there's three. There's three negative well, options here. They can publicly shame you via the Twitter or the Pastebins. I know, right? Um, they can do nothing and just forget about it. Or you run the risk of a lovely thing that we refer to as co-discovery, where somebody else found that vulnerability and maybe they sell it on the dark web. Maybe that's they, where I was going to go. Yeah, I, I didn't know if that was maybe a they one. <laughs> maybe there's like an adversary out there who wants to use it to breach breach your customer base. Like there's so many worse things that could happen. So it's a it's a huge investment and it's a huge like investment in in 
people and resources and equipment and processes and policies. But if you don't have it, like the risk is so much worse. Um, so I kind of feel like it's it's one of those things that's just it's just necessary. It's just kind of the way that we the way that business has to happen in order to really be able to make sure that your structure and your your foundation doesn't get swept away. I think it's it's so much easier to sell it now than what it used to be. I mean, it was hard before when you're you know you're trying to say why this is important because there wasn't there was examples, but they were sort of few and far between. And now there's just like tons. How yeah, many vulnerabilities yeah. are there a day on like our favorite like Linux spaces and things like that? It's just nonstop. Yeah. And like you can you can reasonably point to other examples now and say like, look, all of these other places have this and nothing terrible happened to them or they were able to look at the positives and they were able to to make all this progress based on be faster and more efficient and better and more responsive to their customers based on this. So that's kind of my perspective on it. Crow, what are your thoughts? I have a lot of thoughts. Um, first and foremost, it's our duty to be a steward of the organization's brand. It's our job to help work with others like in legal or PR to help make sure that the brand is uh, protected and we're not doing things that jeopardize that value for the customers and the enterprise. Um, we do that by being a trusted advisor and it's hard. We have some really great talking points we're gonna get to about how to do some of that, but it's critical for us to become that trusted advisor, both from a technical engineering team aspect the executive leadership that you have to prove that you understand kind of what the corporate strategy is and how you and by your existence enable that you help them go faster and achieve that velocity and return on investment they want out of their deliverables. And then you also need to prove yourself to your support and sales and customers. Um, you know, every day, every day you are proving your value. It, it, unfortunately, things change very rapidly. Uh, much more rapidly than they ever did. At least it jokes. There's a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in the open source space. It's um, explosive compared to the amount of people that used to look at this back 10, 5, 10, 15 years ago. There just weren't as many people publicly looking about it, uh, looking at it. They weren't as uh, we didn't have the structures in place to be able to intake a lot of this stuff. Uh, but no, it, it's our, our job is to help protect the brand and kind of, again, earn that trust and respect of all the constituents so that we can provide that wise counsel as we're helping the organization manage their risk. I, I think you said an important part, you know, thinking about what are the core values of the company. And if one of the core values is about customer, customer trust, customer, customer transparency um, in that aspect, it's really easy then to sort of sell the security into that into that space and how it fits in. So I, I think that's a really good thing because those core values are usually set and they're set from you know the CEO and, and way there. And then we could we could bounce on that and say this is how we fit into that world. And and from a customer standpoint, it is sometimes um, required by their either their contracts, their legal team, sometimes it's a government thing where they have specific requirements that if you're using certain types of suppliers, they must demonstrate how they manage vulnerabilities, how they educate, how they make customers aware that there's potential uh, threats and whatnot. So it's contractual or sometimes a legal requirement as well. So it it is a much easier sell than it was back when old guys like Josh started out. <laughs> no, you, you actually hit on a really good point though. And this is the way that I start talking about P-CERT and, and even the bug bounty program or any part of the VDP itself and SDL, it is about trust. And that, that's the reason we do this is to establish trust with our customer and our partners. And we do that through acting with integrity, through our transparency, through our diligence to uh, applying the best practices to build the most secure product. It's not that we're going to solve every problem now, right? We're going to we're going to have to keep working at this, but the fact that we're going to be an engaged partner with our customers changes the game. And that trust translates to revenue. 
there's a direct correlation. That's what sales is all about. And to me, when I go and talk to executives about about PCERT, that's where I start because they're they have. And maybe I'm, I'm over exaggerating a little bit, but I feel like they have the weight of the world of, on their shoulders with respect to the business, to the business strategy, to the revenue that they need to drive and the future of the company. I mean, they're they're helping to set a direction that's going to ensure the company is viable for you know years to come. So they they need all the help they can get in building that trust with customers. So the idea of of using a tool like the vulnerability disclosure program in a company to help foster that trust and build that relationship uh, is, I think, a critical component. All the negatives, the, the stick that goes with that is true too, right? It, you know, you can ignore the trust and say, I don't really don't give a shit about my customers, right? But the other side of the coin, you, you really, you know, you're going to get caught, you know, in the meat grinder of, of regulate, regulatory issues or lawsuits and things like that if you do not demonstrate that you're acting with reasonable consideration to security vulnerabilities. Yeah. Yep. It's funny you use the term reasonable consideration. And recently, I think in the last year or so, I've seen a lot of legal cases that have changed um, and they use the term due diligence. And I think mm -hmm. due diligence used to be applied very heavily to like medical cases of malpractice. Um, and now I think we're seeing a lot of cases that have are no longer that are very much in the cybersecurity realm, and it's interesting because used to be you know medical malpractice, a doctor commit you know there's a mistake a doctor makes and they could be they could be um, prosecuted for that, and then you saw sort of a transition to um, to like HIPAA violations and not protecting data with due diligence, and now um, the same term has started to pop up when we talk about things like breaches. Um, and not having provided due diligence. And I think a, pre a PCERT team allows you to have that, uh, to be able to adequately, like just you can demonstrate that you're providing due diligence. Yeah, it, it, in the legal term, we do care. Are you doing yeah, due care? Are you doing your due diligence? Are you taking reasonable measures a reasonable mm -hmm. organization is analogous to you would take? Right, exactly. And you need to be able to demonstrate that along the way. And this is where the the work that uh, I would say the role of a PCERT plays nicely into this, right? Because in effect, these are escapes. So how are you handling those escapes to communicate uh, and, and to mitigate them and then communicate it back to your customer base? Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Depending on the company that you're in, you may have a very diverse business set. Um, there may be challenges in taking a PCERT that should scale across the company and then applying that to every business unit. So when you're having a conversation with an executive, what are you thinking about when you're trying to understand how they operate? What are some of the things you look for in that conversation to help you better fold into their business model? Um, so one of the things that I learned a long time ago was to not impose my goals on them, but rather understand their goals and figure out how my goals sort of align with theirs. So when they talk about making customers happy, when they talk about, you know, um, having safety measures, when they talk about, you know, making sure that they do secure coding and things like that, um, or if they focus on, you know, different different areas of like, well, we want to be better at coding. We want to not have these vulnerabilities. We know it's a huge expense to to fix vulnerabilities out in the field, um, you know, before uh, GA. So I try to figure out how I I work along with their goals and just start inserting like different parts or tips or things within it so that they don't think it's me telling them what to do, but rather it's now their goals too. So it's sort of a strategic thing that one of my execs talked me a long time ago. How do I, how do I not sound like I'm trying to tell them what to do, but fit into their world? It's it's sort of interesting, fun little. I I say sometimes we're a little bit of sales people ourselves. 
I don't know what your tricks are, but that's the one thing that I learned. No, I think that's a that's a good approach. In fact, I use that often. I I try to point out that we're not in the business of telling you what to do. We're in the business of helping you understand the guardrails that you should operate within and then to facilitate your ability to make business decisions within those guardrails. So that it's not it's not saying that you can't drive, you know, drive outside of the the guardrails, but there are there are reasons why you shouldn't and we're here to help make sure you understand what those reasons are. So when you're making a business decision to deviate from what the industry might consider the norm, you're making an educated uh, decision, right? What about directly establishing a P-cert? I mean, we have a lot of people we know in the industry that are trying to get a P-cert off the ground. They're hired and they are a P-cert of one. Some of us may have been in that position before. I don't know what uh, you're talking about. <laughs> How, you know, how do you sell an organization on recognizing that that's not enough? All right. It's a hard one. Um, I, I say that there's always two angles. Um, I like to, to, you know, work up and then also work down and then hope that they're communicating this way within the BU. So, you know, um, if I'm not the exec in charge or my sponsor team, I, um, I tend to often um, give them jobs, <laughs> manage up type of thing, <laughs> and tell them to, to, to them be the sellers of the higher level. And then, you know, when I was more on the lower position, then I was working with the cross teams to try to explain to them why it was important. And usually it tried to meet in the middle. Now I'm in a different role where I'm more one of the ones trying to focus on the execs here and have my team focus on the, the you know, the level here. A lot of the times um, it's trying to, like I said, understand their goals, understand their vision, and then making sure that I'm explaining what a P-cert is and then giving them like and the KPIs and the importance and like make, like I'm making sure that I'm talking to them now. Um, and I, I often get said that I, I use acronyms, right? So like my boss said, hey, Lisa, stop using acronyms so much because this isn't their world all the time. So how do you make sure that you're relating to them and giving them the right artifacts that relate to their world? So that's one of the ways, but it's not easy when you're a person of one because then you're, trying to yeah. cover both grounds. <laughs> I think ideally there, I'm not sure that the person of one is a sustainable solution. <laughs> um, no, I think we all kind of agree with that. And so that, that comes back to the whole, I think, reason that we're having this discussion because you want to talk to your execs because a, a P-cert of one is really not sustainable. And so you really need that advocacy and buy-in. And without the advocacy and buy-in, I mean, you're you're doomed to some really long nights by yourself. So, I mean, it's it's about it's from to my, from my perspective, it's about making the business case. So it's like as Lisa said, you have to talk to people in their own language, and you have to build allies and build advocates. Because, I mean, if I can get one or two people who understands the value of a piece hurt, then I can I can allow them to amplify my message, right? And so that's the the surrogate sort of strategy there. You don't. It's not all about one and there's so many different options and avenues for trying to communicate how important it is internally and externally like PSER teams basically act as an advocate for the security vulnerability you're both the advocate within your organization and the advocate outside of your organization so this facilitation has a lot of power and it has a lot of benefits because you can talk outside the organization you can show how how PCER teams have brought value to other organizations and how well those other organizations have done and benefited from that. So it's all about getting, making the business case, using metrics that are understandable, showing comparisons and building those allies and alliances and, and advocates. Without that, I, I think you'll never institutionalize a change. You'll always be a PCER to one. Well, if you're a PCER to one, there was some something that inspired the organization to start that journey. 
So if you are in that position, you need to understand what circumstances arose or what business drivers made some executive that has no security experience decide to fund some type of product security team. And that's, as you all said, it's it's a long, going to be a long journey. But if you can understand that why, why this was important for the organization to start with, you can start to build your case through metrics, through peer comparisons, um, executives. One thing all executives love is they love to hear what the guy across the street's doing. That's their yeah. favorite thing. I, I, I do that a lot. I, yeah. I utilize our peers, our partners, our competitors, and show you know what they're doing and why it's a value. Um, I also don't ever let a good good story not go to use. So I utilize other people's stories to sell. Um, you know, like when I think about the maturity of what I'm trying to do in the company that I'm in and how I'm continually trying to mature them, I talk about why what this situation like, you know, like Heartbleed was so monumental, right? Um, and I, I could even start with saying Heartbleed. And this is why we now are trying to figure out open source dependency management in most companies and figuring out it, it's the, I know you roll your eyes, but it's hard. There's a lot of teams that don't know maybe, what they consume. Maybe you shouldn't use it if you're not going to manage it effectively. Would yeah, be my yeah. advice. Uh, I, I understand. Great. But people started using it without understanding the consequences of using it, which was a common industry mistake. Um, yeah, no, not you, but yeah, but, but a lot of other companies. Um, but anyways, the point is, is that, you know, use that story to show wh why you need to mature. Um, you know, uh, I always like to think of like some of the other ones, the Equifax, the Target stories, like things like that, like. Um, you know, they're, they're important, they're, they're media attention, and they, they change the way we do security for all of us. And they did. Uh, they did, Probe. They did. You're giving so me the fact, <laughs> uh, in the long view, Target is lost nothing. Uh, they have regained everything back that they were some yeah. reputational loss and some they had to go pay a bunch of credit monitoring and they got sued and potentially settled. But at the end of the day, the business survived and is flourishing, especially now. But why did they the come back? Now there's security. There's security. people in the industry. No, but there's people in the industry that will go and tour their facility to see their new security facility. They knew how to sell this bad situation into a better one. And they hired the best of the best to be able to do it. They turned a bad situation around. And that's what I'm saying. Like, if you didn't have your bad situation yet, you can utilize somebody else's bad situation to sell why it's important. So there was, a, there was actually, a, I think it was Bill Clinton's chief of staff maybe it was Rahm Emanuel and I can't remember who he was but there, he's got a very famous quote about how you should never let a, a good crisis go to waste there and, you, go. you know uh, I think it's it, it says here uh, what I mean uh, what I mean by that is an opportunity to do things that you wouldn't have been able to do before and you should never you should never want a serious crisis to go to waste doesn't mean it's your crisis but we learn. The point is that we learn from each other, and you don't have to make the same mistake that somebody else made. That those mistakes allow us to move forward in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do before had we not had the benefit of learning from that mistake. Yeah. There's, there's, I think, a lot of benefit to being a part of an industry group that discusses P certs so that you can learn from everybody else. You can also take advantage, and this is a little bit of a plug for uh, the PCERT services framework that a lot of us had helped to author. And we also um, have the PCERT maturity guide that's both of these are available on uh, first.org. Um, these are good starting places if you're trying to build a case for the PCERT. You're hired into a company and you know you need to be able to sell your executives and what the plan is, what's, what's the vision, what's the future. You can use these to get the building blocks that will allow you to mature into a world-class 
um, vulnerability uh, disclosure program. Um, the other thing I would also recommend is there's a great book uh, called Cybersecurity Law, and I'll, I'll when we do post production on this, I'll make sure that I put this up on the screen. The name of the book, but it's a tome. It's a huge book, um, and it's was I think the the latest publication came out in 2019, but it has a, a case study basically of all the different kinds of either cybersecurity incidents or breaches or um, vulnerabilities that have exposed companies to either fines or lawsuits. And it gives you that ammunition to say, look, here's the crises. Here's a whole series of crises that are within our industry group or in our, our vertical. And this is what happened. Now, if we wanna prevent these and we wanna build trust with our customers, we'll build out this roadmap based on industry best practices that were formed by you know, the first um, PCERT special interest group. And, with and, and yeah, with, with the right practices in place. And here's a roadmap for it for you to follow. And then you can put numbers around it, right? What was the cost, right? How much is it going to cost? Yeah. So. so one of the things that I um, always struggled with is, is I, I call it the crying wolf um, syndrome. Like when, because you want to make sure that an exec never gets blindsided by an issue. So let's say you already have your buy-in, you have your P-cert running, but you 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 want to make sure an exec never gets blindsided by a customer, a media, or they're up there talking about you know some other big selling point, and then all of a sudden some they ask they get asked about some vulnerability. So I always um, try to figure out like how do I give a broad enough reach about issues that I think might ever be brought up in that type of situation, but that I don't always cry wolf with them with every situation and like that they're immune to it. So, um, you know, figuring out like the right, I, I call it a, you know, high profile type of issue or a customer important issue to make sure that I inform the correct stakeholders and execs about these major incidents um, but then I don't do it often enough that they're, they just think, oh, here goes Lisa again, telling you about something. I, I, that was one of my biggest lessons. I think I had to learn when I was starting in PCER is how to find the right balance there. I don't know if you guys felt the same, but that was a thing for me with the execs. That was always a problem that I, I had, um, especially working in the government space. So, uh, for the audience that doesn't know, I came from a government world doing vulnerability coordination, I know. <laughs> uh, so I 20,000 vulnerabilities coordinated in a two year time frame. So um, there was always this, this constant, you would see some congressional representation or, or some senior undersecretary somewhere, some director somewhere would, would be listening to the news or watching CNN or their kids got a wired magazine open or they've got wired magazine open and the next, the next shiny thing. And so there was always this kind of um, y you can't you can't necessarily there are going to be fires, you know, there are going to be fires. But the thing is that if everything's on fire all the time, then nothing is on fire. You, you just can't operate at a level where everything is earth shattering all the time, which means you really need to establish a set of metrics for how bad is this really? Um, and unfortunately, the only people who can do that is within your own organization. So um, that's really, really, you know, discussing a serious risk mitigation and risk management program within your own organization and deciding what criteria make the level for is actually on fire. Um, because some things are going to seem scary. I mean, we used to we used to joke about it that there were vulnerabilities that were like, yeah, it's bad. But I mean, I've got some other vulnerabilities here that'll make you never want to, you know, leave your house again. Um, so which one is actually, when you prioritize them against each other, uh, which one is, is actually worse because you're always going to have that problem of resources. Resources are, I always like to say most things in life are not a pie chart. You know, there's plenty of respect to go around just because I respect Chrome doesn't mean I respect Lisa any less, but when it comes to, when it comes to resources, resources are very much a pie chart. Well, and if I have to take from one vulnerability to give to another, I, you have to do that. Lisa. What you're describing, Katie, is you're understanding what the risk appetite for the organization yeah. is. You're understanding what 
the risk thresholds are. You're going to have an upper risk tolerance that mm -hmm. an organization is willing to accept. And then you're going to have a threshold above that that is the ultimate bar that if you pass this line, the company yep. could cease to exist. Yeah, you got the official. That's the uh, that's the ISACA uh, and the the CISP. You got the you, you, Management you, Institute. You hit me with the CISP knowledge again. I'm having like CISP uh, tests uh, anxiety right now. My hands are sweaty. Risk appetite. Yeah, no, that's that's right. I, I mine was just. Less so that's what you're describing. formal vocabulary. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're describing that for people to understand. As you know, Lisa said, it's the critical incident, the customer concern thing that you need to understand kind of where that line is and how you gently get people up or back them away from it. I'm sorry, Lisa, continue. You were going to no, say that. No, no, it's all good. So I was thinking about um, one of the other things that I learned actually a little more recently um, is that I was making some policy changes and I thought I was doing a good job of informing everybody. Um, but what I was not factoring in is the fact that just what you were saying, like they, they in order to accomplish the policy changes that I wanted to put in place, they need more headcount. Or they need, you know, the, the, and and I was just like, yes, this is a policy because it's the right thing to do. And um, we do our strategy in our fiscal year planning very early on. And um, I wasn't making my policy update until Q3, where we've already started the discussion of headcounts and stuff before that. Um, so I learned that for executives, when we're going to do some policy changes to make sure that they're formed early on and to try to make them earlier part of the fiscal year of, of that, that current year so that um, when they go to do their planning the next year, they could try to think of the headcount they might need to accommodate this policy. That's critical, Lisa. And another technique you can use is implementing your policy in phases where you get it out to the public for co your public for comment and but you say on this date this policy will go into effect or every new major release post this date must comply that way that'll exactly. help people ramp up to it I, I sort of had to play with that a little bit we started the review early on and then um the policy in general went in effect this day but like changing of the SLOs went into effect a later date just so that they could be better prepared. So yes, yeah, some tricks to the trade that, I, that right, you're saying. That I want to, yeah. That helps the business not accuse you of moving the target all the time. If you say very plainly, this is kind of our one to two to three year policy journey we're going to yeah. go through, they can plan for it. And, and as you need to know those dates, just exactly as you pointed out. You have to know what the rules are in your org, like when does budget season start and how can you get stuff in. But at least if you've had this plan, this multi-phased plan, they can start to, they'll have that in the back of their mind. You can remind them as part yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I already realized the struggle gonna... for doing it this year, so I already told them what's going to happen next year yep. so that I, they wouldn't say I never told them. <laughs> totally get it. You got to tell them and then tell them again and then tell them again and then yeah. uh, have realistic timelines in there. And really, you've, you've got to get that strategic thinking kind of what is the long term? What's the long term plan here and what are we going to need to do in order to enable those long term plans, which align with the goals of the business? Exactly. Josh, Josh you've been so quiet. <laughs> yeah, you're quiet and you. You had no, you you I think deal you're all with making, executives a lot. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I deal with the same situations, but I think you're all bringing up really good points. And you have to read your audience. You have to know your company. You have to develop a, you know, if especially if you're new in a company, you have to start to reach out to all of the constituents that you would normally you you would need to work with in order to garner support for the P cert. Don't go straight to the top and say, this is what I need to do. You're going to surprise everybody in the process, right? So you need to go and talk to everybody around you and and w basically warming the water, right? Get them familiar with you. Get them comfortable with you. Listen to what they have to say. Understand what their needs are. Integrate that into the plan that you're about to lay out and then collectively go up. 
and say, we need this. And they're going to be your best support. It's sometimes it can it can really hurt you if you're the, the lone person standing up saying, I need this. If you have everybody saying they need this, that's more powerful. So a, a, a technique to do that is you create an advisory board. You get the subject matter experts. You give them a fancy. You're part of the advisory board. They get very excited. And then you kind of convince them that your ideas are theirs. And then they become your biggest advocates. Right. Once, they, the once it's their idea. But it gives them the opportunity to collaborate, to voice their opinion. You can debate and hash it out before it actually goes up to you know the big boss. Everyone's going to know all my tricks and now <laughs> but, but again yeah. I tell you you really know when you won when you're on a call and someone says someone else says why are we doing this and you're about to speak and someone else jumps in and says why we're doing it and they're saying your words but they're saying it and they're believing it and you're like oh my god they got it it was great yeah. like yeah you turned you turned I into we right. yeah and that's a good way Josh, to put it Josh said, you know, I to to they, you know, they need this. But what you ultimately want is you want I into we need this. We all need this together. And so nobody should feel like it's us versus PCERT. It should be PCERT is all of us. That's the I that's the end goal. So when we think when we think about things like um, I want to switch the subject a little bit because it's it's like, okay, we now got them sort of on board. And the next thing is, is how do we how do we show them what good looks like and what do they think good is? And and they might not know what good is. So so what I've been focusing lately on is, is like, what are the key KPIs? What is it that I'm trying to push um, that I want them to be interested in pushing to? And how do I put it in a good view metrics wise presentation wise sometimes i only get 15 minutes and i'm usually sharing it with scl stats too at the same time every every quarter so how do i fit those right things in to tell them that's what i tend to sometimes struggle with well i can tell you really quickly because i know josh has a lot of thoughts on this um but I would say one of the things that it's very important that you couch is that more tickets does not equal bad because I've run into that several times where I've had uh, I've had executives say to me, I don't understand, Katie, we've spent this amount of money on this. Why do we keep having why are the ticket counts higher this year than they were last year? And I have to say, well, because we're doing a better job. And so we've increased our reputation. And so people are actively partnering with us. And so we're actually finding out more. Those issues always existed. We just didn't know about them until now. And so it's important to couch that more does not equal worse in some cases. And you need to have context around your metrics. That's really important. Yeah, I talk about the curve going like up and then like starting to, um, you know, never go down. It will never disappear. But like once you really start going, you're going to go up before you go down again. If you do go down, I mean, you may plateau out and just ride out. I think that's it really, you know, the metrics are going to depend on a couple of factors, right? One is how your P-cert is structured. Are you a distributed model P-cert where you rely on the rest of the business or are you self-contained where you as a P-cert actually will fix all of the vulnerabilities um, and you don't need the rest of the business to to um mitigate the vulnerabilities and disclose them and if you're you know like i've worked in distributed model p certs before and in that case you you i and i've heard this before too just what you were saying right that well you know we need to track you know we need to reduce the number of p cert tickets year over year by 10 percent what what exactly did that just prove right yeah it's it it really is a terrible metric right it, and it yeah. does the other problem with with that kind of a metric is it also puts the onus on the PCER team. So w what motivation do I have to actually create PCER tickets then when I should be, right? I should be tracking those. So my uh, my focus lately has been on making sure if there's third party component issues that we're finding them and it's not our customers or our researchers telling them, telling us about them, that we have our right 
you know, understanding of what open source we're using and what vulnerabilities are out there or working with our vendors. We call it vendor coordination, which is a positive thing. So highlighting those type of practices. So trying to highlight the good practices, trying to highlight that we'd rather have more internally found issues. So just like you're saying, I don't cause it a negative. Actually, if you have more internally found issues than, than customer or third party researcher issues, then you get a positive thumbs up from me. Because I, I really want to make sure that we are owning and finding the issues ourselves. So that's lately but my major KPIs have been about. Sorry, I interrupted you. I was all excited about my KPIs. No, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, for, for me, I think I focus on, um, to me, time is the biggest enemy of a piece or ticket. The longer you know about a vulnerability and have not mitigated it, have not communicated to your customer, the greater the liability you have as a company and the greater risk you put your customer base into. Right? Certainly. So, well, time's like the always, everybody always looks at time. Right. Well, well, well I, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully they do. But but you also have to chunk that out into time slices. And 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 you can't use that, though, to beat up the rest of the business and say, hey, look, you didn't get this done. You didn't get through triage in a certain period of time on average. That's not the point of it. The point is to use that as a guide to how you adjust the business model. Right. How do you change the way your team performs? It is not meant to beat people up. Right. Yeah. The, the business doesn't exist to fix vulnerabilities. Right. The business exists to add value to your customers and to right. create, captivate their interest in dollars. So, it, again, it's if you establish those benchmarks saying this is kind of an, an industry expected average for delivery Target, of these things, wise, whatever, faster, mm -hmm. better. But we understand you have a product release schedule, you have other demand, you know, high, you know, customer really critical customer RFEs or other kind of defects, we get it. We're part of that equation, but we need you to be more aware of that and the, the impact some of this stuff could have that if we are fine, you know, the customers, if anything, uh, hate slow responses to vulnerabilities more than most anything else from a support standpoint, because they, they have their regulators, they have their stupid third party scanners that are all blinky and red with a billion false positives. But you know, their pressure, the customer's pressure is to get this stuff off that dashboard. And you need to be able to articulate that to your uh, business constituents to say, not the most important, but it is a factor that you need to, as you, if you have two bugs, kind of weigh that as you're considering what to work on. All right. I, I want to go back to something, though, earlier, something I said that Crobe called out. And uh, Krobe, I want you to talk to this and, and correct it. We, you know, I, I mentioned the term best practice. This is a little deviation, but I want I want Krobe to explain what was wrong with that statement. So you should never use best practice because that is something that is a legally understood term. And if you say you're following the best practice and you end up in court, you need to prove that that is the best practice. Otherwise, your case falls apart. And what should people be using? You want to highlight good practice. Industry. This is a generally accepted good practice. Right. We follow these frameworks that are broadly yeah. accepted in the industry. There are other ways to phrase it, but don't ever use best practice because, again, that sets a threshold that is measurable, and it, it is very easy to find some clown that did a little better, and now your whole case is in the toilet. Yeah. Um, before we wrap it up, because I know we're going to wrap up soon, I have one more just comment because when we were talking about execs and educating them, one of the major roles that execs play is, um, you know, risk exception. So Katie sort of touched on it a, a little bit earlier of when do you accept this versus that and things like that. But I, I mean, as a piece, we're there to guide, you know, think about what legal is there for in a general sense as legal doesn't approve. They give you advice of what you should do. And that's exactly sort of what a, a P-cert does is they're giving you the industry practice, the customer uh, ass and, and trying to, to put a path forward for what we consider to be the best um, um, lower risk to our customers in the company. But ultimately, the executives are the ones that accept that. They accept the policy. They accept when a team is not 
following the SLOs that are set out within the timeframes that we want issues to be fixed or addressed. Um, they're the ones that are also accepting if there's a chance that we cannot fix something. So, um, you know, making sure that execs are prepared with the right information to make that informed decision is a key, key thing of a P-cert to do because you will have plenty of product teams that will just say, hey, we're not going to go address this exec, you sign off. And that's not what you want. You want to make sure the exec has all the factors like what is the severity? What is the actual risk to a customer? You know, how many customers are on this? Is there a mitigation? Is there an easy path to move up to something that could safeguard them? Like all of those type of questions you, you need to make sure you're asking and risk exception and exception procedure is a, a huge thing. Hopefully we'll talk about it one day in more depth, but um, just something to, to, to think about when you're thinking about execs. With that, Katie, last words, last bits of advice. It's hard. I'm going to go from the human perspective because that's what I do. Every single person comes to the table with their own with their own goals and and their own perspective. And so as with walking into any conversation, understanding what that other person's goals and perspective is allows you to have a more constructive conversation. So you're the the idea of a P-cert is to help be an advocate for every for the for the security issue. So it's not an us versus them. It's not everybody against P-cert. It's not P-cert against everybody. It's P-cert is here to facilitate the best possible outcome for the end user. And ultimately for the business, because that's how revenue works. Right. Crow, words of wisdom. When I'm talking to executives, I use three techniques. Um, first off is SBAR. I describe the situation. I provide a quick background. I give an assessment of what the problem is, and then I provide a recommendation. When I'm giving my recommendations, I use a technique called FIRM that focuses on the financial impacts, the infrastructure impacts, the reputational impacts, and the market competitiveness impacts. Then after I describe what could happen, I'd use another technique called options and impacts. Here are the choices at here are the decisions we can make that we understand based off of the evidence we have and the data we've collected. And here's what we project could happen if you pick these different outcomes and that those three techniques have helped us. Uh, come, you know, kind of join the pool of shared meaning with the business folks and giving them uh, talking to them in their language without jargon and giving them an opportunity to kind of understand uh, what all the consequences could be and kind of understand that there are choices to make. And one of those choices is accepting or ignoring the thing. And you know, hey, they're entitled to do that. It's their company. Very good. That was a good way to end. Yeah. Uh, one, one last thing I'll, I'll add is that, <laughs> well, I, I meant to say this earlier, but we all have to remember that um, security operates at the behest of the business, not the other way around. So we're we're in a business, we're making money, and we're meeting the needs of our customers. So we can't uh, we can't ever forget that. So, all right, folks. Well, thanks very much for listening and watching. Hopefully, you learned a little something, and look forward to seeing you next time.